Atec India welcomes all the participants uh, for today's regional distance learning seminar series. Uh, today's topic is care of uh, CL HIV uh, post ART initiation. And today's speaker is Dr. Suprita Basu. Suprit Basu uh, is MD in pediatric and is currently in uh, DM, senior resident, uh, clinical uh, immunology and uh, rheumatology with the department of uh, pediatric at uh, PGI MER, Chandigarh. We welcome you, sir, uh, and uh, request you to start the session. Okay, thank you. So I will be going through the topic of today, that is the care of a child with HIV AIDS after initiation of the antiretroviral therapy. So uh, today's objectives are, first we will learn a bit about components and objectives of post-ART care, monitoring after ART initiation in these patients, the drug adverse events and its management, and how to substitute the drug. So what is the objectives? Objectives of a post-ART care of a child living with HIV AIDS to, <coughs> to ensure safety, to optimize benefits of ART, to monitor the response, and to detect early treatment failure, the early detection of treatment failure and comorbidities and co-infections in these patients. So when we start ART, what is the normal natural history of disease that is going to happen with antiviral therapy? There will be suppression of the viral progression, there will be viral suppression and there will be clinical and immunological improvement. <coughs> Sorry. There will be improvement in the quality of life and decrease in morbidity and mortality. There are certain opportunity infection that was suppressed because the immunity was suppressed so far. And when we are giving the drug, uh, there is immunological improvement. So what will happen is this immunity will become robust and the manifestation of some opportunistic infections can occur and which can lead to the uh, syndrome known as iris, that is the immune reconstitution inflammatory syndrome. And in some cases, you can see the adverse drug reaction, such as drug sensitivity. So how to monitor therapy? So response to therapy, we can see clinically, immunologically, and virologically. The Clinically, you can see whether the weight gain is there, whether the T staging is coming down or not, whether there is an increase in the CD4 count and fall in the viral load. These all indicate that you are, yeah, the patient is responding to therapy. And there is a chance for this, that is immune reconstitution inflammatory syndrome. As I was telling, whenever we are active, the most uh, Anticipated complication that we can expect is iris, development of iris, that some infection that was suppressed because of the decreased immunity, whenever the immune reconstitution is there, then that infection can flare up. Adverse drug reaction can occur and there can be treatment failure. So after starting of ART, <coughs> there can be two things. Once that the the therapy is effective. So there is a drop in the viral load and there is an increase in CD4 count and the patient improves. Else, what happens? There is non adherence of treatment failure and in spite of therapy, there is increase in viral load and drop in the CD4 count. And the patient's immunity gets weaker and increase the risk of opportunity infections. So, will you monitor? What are the parameters we are going to monitor during follow-up ART initiation? What clinical monitoring that I will come later? Laboratory monitoring, immunological monitoring, and viral load monitoring. So we are doing some blood tests and some clinical investigations. In the clinical monitoring, what are we going to do in children is very important. In every visit, we will go for the monitoring of the growth condition, development. Look to look for screen for tuberculosis, other opportunity infection, to look for treatment adherence, 
and we have to calculate the antiretroviral dose as per the weight in every visit because in every visit there will be some change in the weight and then you have to monitor, change the drug dose as accordingly because in pediatrics as you all know the arv doses is as per the body weight and we give dose as per the body weight now to monitor growth what are the things we are monitoring in growth is the weight the length and weight for length and for these things what we need is a growth chart a uh, growth chart is very very important in pediatrics in every opd we should have a growth chart and we should plot every time whenever the patient is coming we have to plot and see whether the growth is there or normal that is parallel to the plot, uh, plot charts that is already there see the green line is an plot depicts a normal growth and this red line this is a faulted growth so the red line denotes that there is something sinister going on <coughs> sorry here we can see the three types of growth chart have we have found types of growth the first one is okay the child is growing well and we should encourage our caregiver that whatever you are doing is right and you continue but this is not right the second curve that is there is flattening or faltering so we have to assess the child and look for the cause of this faltering after growth comes development and for this development there are many charts like the baroza like the trivandrum so these are developmental screening charts and here what we see whether the child is growing or developing as per his his or her pr age like if this is this, you see the red line a 5 month old boy or a girl if he is unable to this thing that is on the left side the whole head steady if he or she is unable to hold his or her head steady then we have to think that there is some delay in development and why this is important because the patient of hiv is abnormal development without any other focus of infection think of hiv encephalopathy so development assessment should be done in each phase and there are some red flags things. like if a child cannot perform the following activities like cannot hold an object placed in the hand by 5 months or cannot reach out for object by 6 months or cannot run by 2 and a half years so these are all red flag sign this should be taken care of if you are not detecting it early then it will go on and go on and the child will be developmentally retarded so if no such delay we should be referring to a pediatrician now after this growth and development we will go for a clinical assessment and what do you mean by clinical assessment <coughs> so the clinical examination as we do in all examinations this the general will be then we will go for pallor analysis john d cinema club and we have to look whether the patient is lethargic or not skin and bones this oral thrush severe wasting we can see it's severely wasted edematous signs of micronutrient deficiencies are there or not which denotes a poor prognosis and a poor outcomes state of um, health so what are the warning signs so art team needs to be vigilant about symptoms and signs pending a new clinical event so every time they are coming we have to see that this red flag signs that they are not warning signs like weight loss sudden onset fatigue loss of appetite repeated episodes of vomiting and diarrhea fever issues in adherence of the drug sudden fall in cd4 or a rising viral load or a presence of new neurological or hepatological manifestation if these are there we have to think something sinister is happening or the disease is not controlled 
How will you check the adherence of the drug? You have to check the pill count, report by the caregiver, the boxes that is empty, you should refill it and check the pill charts. Now I will come to case-based scenarios. Like this is a story of an eight-year-old girl who has come for pill pick, was on ALD, Abacavi, Lamivirin, Dolutegravi, weight is 22 kg. And the report suggests that CD4, CD4 level has fallen and the viral load report is 10,000. And as for the father, the grandmother is giving her pills and she is giving it regularly. On inquiry, we found that the child revealed that she was taking two and a half tablets of pediatric AL 630 twice a day. So what is the issue here? They are telling, in spite of taking the drug, there is a fall in CD4 and increase in the viral load. So what has happened? Here? So the, what is the weight of the child is 22 kg. <coughs> so if we go through the chart, there is 20 to 25 kg. 60 30 tablet we should be giving three and three three tablets twice a day and what they were giving they were giving two afters <coughs> so it is a wrong dose and hence viral suppression was not there so what we have to do is we have to in each visit we have to check whether the patient is taking the right medicine at the right dose and with good compliance. That is the thing that we have to ensure. There is something called adherence fatigue. What do we mean by adherence fatigue? Basically, it occurs in a period of around two years after initiation of antiretroviral therapy. What happens that after giving ERT for a prolonged there is some change in the confidence level and attitude to treatment. <coughs> there is an expression of feeling bad and the symptoms and the caregiver is also instead of giving the drug and looking after the same. <coughs> so hence to prevent this adherence fatigue, what we need is Repeated and continued counseling is needed. Else, what will happen after two years, three years, there will be defaulted in therapy and again the viral load will increase. Now, what is the after this follow up? We are coming now to the laboratory part. So, what are they going to do? on a laboratory investigations we are going to do in follow-up. So, on the first day, day zero, when the patient has been diagnosed, you are, we are going to do all the complete hemogram, liver function, renal function, a urine, a lipid profile, sugar, CD4 count, viral load, and a screening for tuberculosis. And in case of pregnancy, Adolescent girls, we are going to see the pregnancy testing. And after this, after 15 days, 30 months, uh, 30 days, two, three months, if we have started the patient on Gidovudin, so we are going to look for the hemoglobin because it causes anemia and bone marrow suppression. And at six months and six months thereafter, we are going to do tests for complete hemogram, RFT, RFT, and depending upon the drug, we are going to now coming to the second case. This is a master J who has taken six months of first line ART. So the first line ART is TLD, telephobic, lamivirin, dotagami. And he underwent a viral load testing on 2nd September 2021. Plasma viral load report was TND, target not depicted. So what will you explain to the patient and caregiver? So after giving six months of retroviral therapy, uh, 
high load is good, that is target not detected. So what we have to tell, two things. One is, yes, you are doing a good job, the act is working and it should be continued lifelong. We have to adhere, counsel for treatment adherence. Another point is, the load report is undetectable, but that does not signify that the present ED of HIV virus. And when are you going to the next viral load test? It will be six months. That is around September. So it will be around March, first week of March. How to clinically interpret HIV-1 viral load reports? So whenever we are doing a viral load testing, the report can be in three cases. One, the very good thing that I already discussed that the viral load is detectable, that is TND, the last part. So it means that HIV has disappeared, not, not mean that HIV that is still there in the reservoirs and we have to continue drug. And the other two instances can be whether the viral load is less than 1000 or more than equal to 1000. So our target is at least we should achieve a viral load of than 1000. If it's less than 1000, it means the virus is suppressed and the antiviral regime is working. If it is more than 1000, then we have to think that it's something is not right. Either the patient is not taking the drug or the drug is not working. This is a case scenario of a 12 year old boy, Master K, been on EIT for the last three years. So whenever we are seeing taking for two years, three years, five years, so we always have to check, as already I said, whether the fatigue is coming or not. So what happened here? The child's viral load has been tested is 10,000, way above 1,000. So what are you going to do? So the same thing, there is some issue with the adherence. So counselor has to provide three sessions of special adherence counseling for consecutive three months, monthly for consecutive three months. We have to check the doses of ARV that has been described, prescribed whether it is arose or not, whether the child is taking properly or not, and we have to find efforts to find the problems and solutions for reasons of the child not taking pills daily, if at all. If balance is more than 95%, so we have counseled and after that, what we have found that yes, there is adherence is good in the last three months. So we will plan a repeat viral load testing to check whether we have achieved our goal or not. So it was 10,000 copies after three months came out to be 5,000. So what are you going to do? So again, we have to recheck the child's, now not to recheck the child's adherence in the last three months. We have to, whether he's taking the doses correctly, rule out stock out of drugs. And if, again, if we see no, everything is fine, there is no adherence issue. Now, this is the time that we should, uh, we are going to immediately refer the child to SACEP, the state AIDS expert panel. So we have to refer the case to SACEP. Now there is something known as immunovirological discordance in HIV. So what is this? So it can be so that uh, normally, as I said, after treatment, if the therapy is working, viral load will come down, CD4 will go up. But in some cases, there is a discrepancy in this. Viral load is the CD4 count is not improving, which denotes CD4 count is a marker of immunity. So this denotes that the immunity is very low. So patients 
is detained in CD4, but undetectable viral load. Means, yes, you have controlled, achieved control of HIV, but still the immunity has not came back. So that is, we should evaluate these cases, whether this or the patient has viral infection, or sir, concurrent infection is going on, <coughs> or then it's the leukopenia is due to some antiretroviral drug or some steroid induced or some other immunosuppressive therapy. Possibility of HIV 2 or HIV 1 and 2 co-infections should also be kept in mind. Normally, the viral load that we do is for HIV 1. So it may as well have the patient is infected with HIV 2 and we are testing for viral load of HIV. And that is the reason we are getting uh, undetectable viral load. So as initially I said that we have to do regular CD4 monitoring. But how long? So any patients who are more than five years of age, if simultaneously the CD4 50, viral load is less than 1000, at the same time, then we can stop CD4 monitoring and continue viral load only. Unless and until the again we get that patient is having virological failure or more than 1000 copies per ml, then again we have to go for the CD4 count. But the last line is the treating, it's the decision of the treating doctor. He can request for CD4 or viral load test whenever he needs Now, we have started on ART. So now to coming to the criteria or definition of a stable child on ART, what do you mean? So for two to 10 years of age, what do you mean by a stable child is, the child is receiving ART for at least six months and the viral load is suppressed. Plasma viral load is less than 1000. And he is on the same regime for at least the last six, three months. And he has no intercurrent illness with a good treatment adoration. And the weight height is well preserved and he is gaining weight and height. So this is the known as stable child for two to 10 years. And for more than 10 years, the definition is almost the same. He had to, for six months, no adverse event, no opportunity infection and a suppressed viral load. Now we come to another facet of the talk, that is the adverse drug reaction. So every antiretroviral drug will have its own adverse effects. It can be acute, immediately after the drug, subacute within six months, and late, that is more than six months. And it can be mild, it can be moderate or severe. And the last one is the serious or potentially life threatening. But in case of HIV, it's, you are giving so many drugs, the patient is prone to infection. So there can be many things. It may look like there is something called mimickers of adverse drug reaction in retro. That is the opportunity infection. After drug, we develop jaundice. We think it of a drug, but it can be due to hepatitis, malady, anything. Or it can be some complication of HIV infection, iris, as I already said, or reaction to some drugs other than ARV or ART, like we are giving isoniazid and that has caused hepatitis. We have given septran, cotrimoxidone, that is given to rather not the drug per se. Now, a uh, case scenario on adverse drug reaction. So we have a master PQR, eight year old, was started on ALD three months back. He was asymptomatic with a CD4 of 145. Now the child has developed high grade fever, three months of therapy, high grade fever, headache, nausea, projectile vomiting. So features of raised ICP is there. 
and investigation revealed hemoglobin 11.4 CD4 count is 325. Initially it was 145, now the CD4 is 325. And CSF is positive for India. <coughs> so what do you think? What this child has? Yes, it is iris because so whenever we are treating a child, our aim is to have a low viral load and an increase in CD4 count. So this patient has count has increased. So you cannot say the drug is not working. The drug is working. So treatment failure is out of question. You cannot tell this uh, adverse event of the drug because there's a new infection or the basically cryptococcus was there after giving the air the iris has offered and the unmasking of the cryptococcal infection has offered. So, as I was telling, in the adverse event, there is a hypersensitive reaction. So, serious and sometimes fatal hypersensitive reaction can be observed in around 3 to 5 percent of adults and children. And most common is the abacavi. And it occurs within the very first six weeks. And the patients who have a HLA-B5701 allele has increased chance of hypersensitive reactions with abacavi. Symptoms are fever, GI symptoms, respiratory symptoms, pancreatitis, hepatomegaly, and laboratory or radiologic abnormalities. So this is the sign symptoms of a hypersensitive reaction in case of Avakavi. What are the side effects of Zidovudin? The Zidovudin side effect is mostly what, as I showed you, that we have to do a serial hemoglobin level because the most common side effect is anemia and neutropenia, hematologic toxicity. So we have to monitor CBC whenever we are starting because we have to know this toxicity because we are going to monitor these things and follow up. Less common things, okay, we can not remember, but the more common to keep in. Xenophobia. <coughs> so the first thing is that we have to start it when the renal function is normal because the renal toxic drug. And the Complications are nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, flatulence. So renal and bone toxicity in growing children remains a concern. And for this close monitoring of tenophobia, toxicity in adolescents on tenophobia should be done. Now coming to lopinavirinavir, that is the protease inhibitor group. Apart from the yeah, headache, rash, Another thing is the hyperlipidemia. That is the reason why whenever a patient is on protease inhibitor, we commonly, whenever they are coming on follow-up, we do a lipid profile to look whether this lipidemia is occurring or not. We have to look for it. So whenever we are sending blood, apart from hemoglobin, uh, there is is there. I will answer it after the talk. So hyperlipidemia, hypercholesterolemia, hypertriglyceridemia, insulin resistance. So these are the adverse effects of protease inhibitor. So what I was telling that whenever we are getting patients who are on protease inhibitor, certainly apart from Complete hemogram LFT, we should send a lipid profile also. Now, the drug that has been added recently is the dolutegravir. And what is the side effect? This weight gain. And they also got dyslipidemia. So, weight gain is a very common side effect of dolutegravir, but the mothers will never complain of weight gain because what they will tell after starting off this drug, the child is feeling well. And gain uh, and the their uh, the thinness or, or uh, not gaining weight that has improved. So they will attribute that the weight gain to the good response to the drug. But weight gain is a side effect, 
and a very rare defect that is neural tube defect that is debated now. I will not go into the details of that because uh, whether at all neural causes neural tube defect or not, that is totally debatable because uh, and <coughs> not our adverse events of nevilapine. Nevilapine most common is the hypertoxicity and severe skin rash and hypersensitive reaction like Steven Johnson syndrome. And underlying hepatitis B or C co-infection is the predisposing factor for developing of this SJS. So at the AST center, if a child comes with skin rash, so apart from maybe the other drugs can be if a village port time of sojourn and in many centers, lamivudin has been identified as an offending drug. Otherwise, any you can get case reports of many other drugs like ginovudin, lopinavir, atazanavir, dolutegravir causing skin rash. So these are case reports only, but nevirapine, ifavirin, and cortamoxazole we have to keep it. So now. If you are suspecting an adverse reaction, what are we going to do? First, we have to be sure this is an adverse drug reaction. We have to rule out opportunity infection, as I said, iris. And then we have to grade the adverse reactions according to the severity. So how are we going to grade it? It can be graded according to the severity, whether it is mild, moderate, severe, or for our life threatening. So there are criteria that there. It is very tough to remember it. So we have to check the chart every time we are doing it. So drug rash can be also graded, like erythema only. That is the grade one. And the most severe is the grade four. That will have that can be fatal or Steven Johnson syndrome 10, for which you have to give some other therapy also, like IVI or cyclosporine, like that. So, how will you manage? My moderate, if the severity is there, mild to moderate severity, we will avoid changing the regimen. We will offer symptomatic therapy under close monitoring. In case of severe, we have to discontinue the expected drug. And it may be possible to substitute the offending drug with another drug from the same class. And in case of serious side effects, serious or potentially life-threatening side effects, We have to discontinue all the drugs and hospitalize the patient. It is life threatening, so it, it, it's needless to say we have to admit. And if the patient clinically improves, then alternate regimens would be involved in class. And for this, we have to take opinion from the sachet. Now, coming what is substitution and what is switching of a drug. Substitution means replacement of a single drug. Due to a, it can be to adverse drug reaction or a drug drug interaction or intervals. And it does not mean the child is being put on second line ART, even though you are using a second line drug. <coughs> Whereas, what do we mean by switching? Switch. It means we are changing the entire regimen. Why? Because there has been a treatment failure. So switch means we are totally switching to a new regimen. So from the first line, we are switching to a second. In substitution, we are only changing one drug, replacing basically. For drug substitution, the guidance guideline says 
single drug substitution 43 should be made within the same ARB class. If a life-threatening adverse drug reaction occurs, we have to stop all drugs until the patient stabilizes and then we will start a revised regimen after taking opinion of the SACEP. And if a person loves dual antiretroviral toxicity, he should be referred to a pediatric HIV expert or a pediatric center of expertise. So, if like first line toxicity, then is, in this chart, you will have the alternate substitute. How can you change it? These are given for all the first line antiretroviral. You can go through the chart. This is the drug dose schedule. You should be having it in hand always while prescribing and in every visit you should have it. Because whenever the child is suppose last visit was 9.5, after three months they came 10.4. So the drug doses get changed. So it is a very important part of management. So now the take home points, what we have antiretroviral related adverse events may overlap with HIV associated conditions, that the organ dysfunction, opportunity infection, iris, and other common childhood diseases or similar side effects of concomitant medication. Differentiating antiretroviral related adverse events from these conditions pose a great challenge. It's very tough whether it is an adverse event or some opportunistic infection. It's very tough to differentiate. And the most common side effects are self-limiting and reserve on continuing ARV with simple supportive measure, itching. You give a antihistaminic, it will resolve. For adverse events, the most important barrier for optimal allergies. So if a patient develops adverse events, then they may not like that, or they will be skeptical to use it again. <coughs> Sorry, proactive approach is required. A proper counseling of an understanding child and caregiver should be there before initiation of ART. They should understand, they should know what are the expected side effects. So, thank you. I will be now taking up questions. Whatever question you are there, I will take up the questions from the box. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, there is one question in a chat box. Yeah. Uh, if the patient is HIV-1 and with CD4 virological discordance, what extra things we should have? What should we do in their follow-up? So, as already I said, if you go back to the slide, the monitoring of... Uh, there is the slide... Where is the virological? Basically, if the load is low, but the CD4 count is not optimal, apart from HIV2, other things that can be, we have to look for is that now, if you see for the last one or two months, there has been an increase in viral infection in the city of Chandigarh or anywhere else in the country, the season change, all these things. So we have to rule out recent whether dengue. Dengue can also cause cytopenias and lymphopenia, and the C4 count will be low. So what we can do, we can check it if viral load is low, C4 count is low, but the child is otherwise asymptomatic. We will call them only in the next visit, within two weeks, after two weeks, and we will check their CD4 count. And if we then document that the CD4 count is improving, then we can say. Okay, it was due to a viral recent viral infection leading to a suppression. Or we have to look for some concurrent infection, hepatitis B or C is there, or some <coughs> then we check if okay, these are not there. and also not only CD4 count, hemoglobin is also low. Then we can think that okay, some drugs, maybe septron, maybe something that is causing a bone marrow site, this all this is 
pancytopenia is causing. So we have to look for that also. And then we can modify the drug or we can hold it for some time and see whether it is improving or not. Any motion? Okay, participants are requested if you have any question, please unmute your mic. I think no more questions, sir. I will quickly run the feedback form. Okay. Participants have requested, please fill that uh, feedback form. Feedback form is not being displayed, please. Uh, it's working, sir. Just a minute. Uh, please check, sir. Okay, thank you, sir, uh, for this uh, wonderful session. Uh, participants, if you have any question, please ask or uh, I will uh, conclude the session. Uh, sir, can we conclude the session now? Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you all participants uh, for your patience with me.